This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More on that to come shortly. So, Crofty, are you enjoying the uh, the pubs being open again? I'm in Wales. They're not open yet. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you uh, live in the land of the not not free. I don't know how you'd phrase that. But anyway, I, I have very definitely not been going to the pub at the moment. I've been staying in and reading about Greek mythology. So uh, hello to everyone out there at home. Welcome to another episode of Mythological. I think it's Mythological number eight this time, is it? Yep. Number eight. Yeah, we're getting perilously close to double digits at this point. And a year to the week since our first recording. Oh, wow. It was this week last year. <laughs> I did not realise that. So I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing that we only got through seven episodes in that time. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of a better uh, track record in the rest of the year. And they were massive episodes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we've produced more than enough uh, hashtag content in the last year or so to go around and un well from one perspective it may be unfortunate it looks like we're going to have a whole bunch of content on our current subject as well aren't we crofty yes we uh, kept saying let's not do another two-parter and we think this is a two-part job <laughs> mm, definitely definitely uh my name is charles by the way because i just realized i introduced crofty but not myself so hello <laughs> Hello, everybody at home. I am a human with uh, a human name, and I exist. I mean, I doubt some of those facts. Eh, yeah. <laughs> you have to bring out a debunking video. <laughs> so, folks at home, today's episode, I think we teased at the end of the last one, didn't we, Crofty, that today's episode is on ancient Greece. Yes, we have finally made it to ancient Greece after eight episodes. <laughs> yep. I think we uh, very briefly were there during the course of our second episode, but now we're going to actually focus down and get some pure mythology on the channel. And as Crofty said before, we have so much material on this particular person that we're going to be discussing that we split this into two parts. So the first part of this episode is going to cover that person's early life and the first part of a certain group of exploits they are associated with. So Crofty, do you want to reveal... Who the subject of today's episode is. Yes, the man of the hour, the son of Zeus himself, Heracles. Mm. So we need to start off, I think, with the important distinction of that we are mostly today going to be talking about the Greek hero Heracles. What we are largely not going to be doing is talking about the Roman hero Hercules. They are very, very, very similar Obviously, it's a case of the Romans kind of copying the Greeks' homework on this one. But we want to stay focused on the Greek traditions. And we may well return to the topic and look at Hercules in the future. Because two episodes on him just isn't enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Plenty more, more Hercules than you can shake a club at. So as we have increasingly started by asking Crofty, what was your previous familiarity with Heracles, before you started the research for this episode? Well, I was strangely lucky among students in you know, UK primary schools and comprehensive schools in that I actually got to study a lot of Greek as well as Roman and Egyptian mythology from when I was in primary school, which is the UK equivalent of what Americans would call elementary school. So the stories of Heracles or Hercules are things that I've been familiar with since I was quite young, even though obviously they were very uh, sanitised versions. Mm. Quite a lot of what we will cover today was not deemed suitable for children. No, I, I'm not surprised by that. Um, so Crofty, would it be appropriate today to say out of the two of us, you are effectively the, the Heracles scholar here? <laughs> that may be going a bit far because, remember, I left school more than 10 more than 12 years ago. So, you know, I've forgotten a lot since then. Well, you work at university, therefore you're still at school. <laughs> True. That's exactly how that works, <laughs> definitely. Yes. Not working in a classics department doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. So, I am 
basically the diametric opposite of Crofty in this scenario, in that the only scholarly knowledge that I have of Heracles or, you know, knowledge of the original classical Greek sources is entirely what I've filtered through Heracles in popular culture. So my main source of knowledge for this is Hercules, the Disney film, which, as you mentioned, heavily changes and sanitizes almost all aspects <laughs> of Hercules' life. Of course, it's Disney. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Disney. It was part of Disney's weird phase in the 90s where they decided to adapt stories and characters that, that were perhaps too complex for Disney's way of presenting things. Yeah, there were a few of those. <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed it as a kid. It's a bit of a mess watching it as a kid now, a bit all, bit all over the place. There is like whiplash from tragic, heartfelt scenes to comedy scenes to action scenes, and it's just generally a bit all over the place. But so it's a '90s Disney film, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and hey, the uh, video game adaptation on the PlayStation was the first game I played on that console. So uh, there you go. My other vague knowledge of the subject comes from, of all things, uh, Hercules: The Legendary Journeys. The Kevin Sorbo fronted TV show from the 90s, which I remember watching tons of it as a kid. I could not tell you what happens in a single episode. You will be very um, disappointed yes. to hear that I never watched either of those. No, very disappointing. <laughs> so I'm coming at it from uh, what well, I'm doing, I'm coming in here with the perspective of the man on, and woman on the street, is what I'm saying. And you are the high minded. <laughs> snooty academic who is no doubt going to show me up my classics teacher will be so proud <laughs> so that's our basis for what we know about heracles as a subject before we get into heracles proper and discuss not only the man the hero the god and the way he has been presented as such i'd like to take a moment to talk to you about this episode's sponsor so today's episode is sponsored by the great courses plus which is an on-demand educational streaming service that's offering you a free trial today. The Great Courses Plus offers a vast library of carefully curated lectures and courses from world-leading academics. I've recently been re-watching Professor Amanda H. Padani's course on Mesopotamian history, which helped inspire my own video on the topic. The series covers the ancient history of the region from start to end, beginning with the early origins of agriculture in the region, through to its final conquest by Cyrus the Great in the 6th century BC. And if you're looking for something other than history, The Great Courses Plus has over 11,000 courses on a wide variety of topics, including art and literature, science and mathematics, and yes, even mythology. So if you want to access your free trial today, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thehistocrat, or click the link in the description below. Okay, before we get properly started, Crofty, do we want to talk about what sources we used for this particular episode? Uh, yes. When we looked into the primary sources, so the original ancient Greek histories or poetry, etc., I think we both did focus on what could be considered the two most definitive versions, um, wouldn't you say, Charles? Yeah, so we focused really on the narratives given to us by, I think he is, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think he's from the 2nd century BC, but he might be from the 1st. Uh, Diodorus Siculus, or Diodorus of Sicily, who wrote uh, a universal history titled The Library of History, one of the books of which largely deals with the life of Heracles. In addition to this, we also used a document written by what at the time was thought to be a man by the name of Apollodorus of Athens, who wrote his own library, which is probably the best single source for all of Greek mythology, just because he summarised so many stories and wrote them down that had previously been uh, surviving in only fairly disparate sections. So those are the two kind of organised narratives, I think, that we followed and that we're going to be talking the most about today. I'm sure, Crofty, that you as I have, have kind of looked at some of the other primary sources out there that are perhaps more fragmentary. So I looked briefly at some of the works attributed to the epic poet Hesiod, uh, which date from the either the 8th or 7th centuries BC, 
depending on uh, various theories surrounding the composition of his works. Uh, in particular, I read through The Shield of Heracles, and also What Remains of the Few Fragments of the Catalogue of Women, and there are a few parts of his theogony that kind of just offhandedly mention Heracles as well. The rest of my information comes from the works of Homer, which are the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, where Heracles is very briefly mentioned, and I will discuss also briefly in looking to the background of the character. And the final thing which I looked into was a play by a Greek by the name of Euripides called Heracles. So we kind of get a dramatic sense of how Heracles was portrayed as well. Prof D? Uh, yes, I used the same main sources, Apollodorus or Pseudo Apollodorus, as there has been some dispute over who to attribute it to. Um, Diodorus Siculus, um, who I've just double checked, he died in 30 BC. Ah, okay, so he's first century then. Yeah, I just had to double check that. And again, I also got a few bits and pieces from Hesiod's Theogony, Euripides' Heracles, also um, the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses, where I had a bit of extra information, and also the poet Theocritus, provided a couple of quite useful accounts. In addition to these primary sources, I also used a few scholarly articles and books. Probably the most helpful work that I read was the academic work Heracles, part of the Gods and Heroes of the Ancient World series by Emma Stafford, uh, through which much of my information regarding Heracles' background and his development as a character has come from. I also used an article written by the same author, which is Heracles Between Gods and Heroes, and I also went through a transcript of a lecture uh, read by Dr. Silvio Barr, uh, that was held at the Norwegian Institute in Athens in 2018, and it is titled A Gluttonous Strongman and Irascible Stoic, Heracles in Greek Epic from Homer to Nonus. And the final work is something that, Crofty, you uh, very helpfully sent my way, From Bowman to Clubman, Heracles and Olympia by Beth Cohen. I also read through um, Emma Stafford's papers, as well as, like you just said, the From Bowman to Clubman paper. A book that I found very useful was Hercules, the First Superhero, an unauthorized biography by Philip Matizak, who is a professor of Roman history from Cambridge University, but he does reference mostly the Greek sources. As it's more, a bit more of a popular book, there will be points where he doesn't reference the primary sources. And so if I'm mentioning something from his book that doesn't have a primary source, I will make that clear. Also, in terms of the academic papers, as well as the Emma Stafford paper and the From Bowman to Clubman paper, um, another useful one that I found was by Leda Stevanovich, called Human or Superhuman, the Concept of Hero in Ancient Greek Religion and in Politics. Okay, Crofty, I think that's enough discussion of sources. Let's start by getting to the meat of Heracles. And in order to do that, we need to be able to establish Heracles the hero. So in ancient Greece, the idea of a hero is very different from what we would consider a hero now, someone who commits heroic deeds, Crofty. Hmm. Uh, and I believe that you have prepared something of a definition. Yes. So like you say, we would call a hero someone who commits heroic deeds. So for example, we might say that a firefighter would be a hero. They put themselves at risk in order to save lives and protect people. And to us, a hero is something that any person can become by performing such deeds. Yeah, we will see in the paper, hero rescues drowning person from river sort of thing. And it's also a, a status that can be revoked if that person is later found to have committed some sort of evil deed, for example. A firefighter may be called a hero for saving lives, but if it's then revealed that the firefighter started a lot of the fires, they're no longer considered a hero. Yeah. Whereas in ancient Greece, if somebody was a hero, that was a fixed part of their identity, of their story. Whatever evil deeds they may have performed does not take away from that. Yeah. They are fated to be a hero, fundamentally. Yes. because. To be a hero in ancient Greece required some connection to the gods, either 
the gods had visited you and granted you some form of power, or more commonly, you were descended from the gods. For example, every, pretty much every Greek hero that's in the popular consciousness, so Perseus, Theseus, Oedipus, Achilles, etc., was descended directly from a god or from one of the lesser immortals, such as the Nereids or the Nymphs. Mm. Like, I think of all the ones I checked, the furthest removed from a god was Oedipus, who was six generations removed from Poseidon. But quite often they were either the son or the grandson of a god. And this, as well as meaning that they were part of the epic stories that we now come to know, it also granted them quite a bit of special status in the Greek religion. In the paper that I mentioned um, a moment ago, Stefanovic's paper on the concept of the hero, he discusses that the idea of the hero came about as an evolution of a form of ancestor worship, hmm. in that in Bronze Age tribes prior to the formation of the Greek cities, ancestors and founding members of the tribes were, were given special status after they died, there were very special rituals associated with them. And as these city-states began to form from these tribes, then the leaders of these city-states started to try and turn this into a more centralized religion for that city-state in order to essentially create unity amongst people who may not have originally been part of that tribe, or if it's a group of tribes who came together to form what would later become a city-state. And so by giving these original kings or original warlords, whether they were real or fictional, the status of a hero and having certain rituals in order to worship them, that helped create a sense of identity amongst this group. And that's thought to have been how the groups that later became the city-states may have been formed. Mm. And later on, as the stories got more complex, that then led to people such as Cadmus, who founded Corinth. Hello folks, it's Charles here with a quick correction. I just wanted to point out that Cadmus did not found Corinth, he founded Thebes. Crofty did originally get this right during the recording, however I mistakenly corrected him and overruled him, so apologies for that. Back to the show. And the later heroes of mythology, who often kings or lords, would try and trace their lineage back to. For example, Pelops, who later on various kings claim to be Pelopids, or Perseus, various leaders claim to be Perseids, or Heracles, where the kings of Sparta claim to be from the line of the Heraclidae. One final thing to mention about the interpretation, or more of the literary interpretation of heroes, is that while they got many of their superhuman abilities from being descended from gods or had their abilities somehow bestowed on them by gods. From a literary standpoint, what is important is that their personalities come from their humanity, their flaws and their positive traits are only really amplified by that association with the gods. So their positive and their negative traits, while they come from their human side and are merely amplified by this divine connection, rather than coming from the gods themselves, the important thing is that they are still mortal, they still grow and change, whereas the gods, being immortal, are also fixed. The gods do not develop as characters the same way that a mortal half-god hero would, and so that is why a lot of more literary scholars think that they may resonate down the years through the Greeks, through the Romans, and through to modern times. So I think that gives a good overview of what one might consider a hero in ancient Greece. The only thing I would really have to add to that is, in many ways, heroes were worshipped in ancient Greek religion. I think what's perhaps a useful distinction, however, is that they were not necessarily worshipped in the same ways as the gods were worshipped, for example. They would be worshipped usually in the form of a ritual and a feast at which the participants of the ritual would usually consume the flesh of the animal 
the version which I found looking through the various sources I did was that heroes were usually revered by having an animal destroyed rather than feasted upon. And often this was because of the hero's association with the underworld. So obviously with the case of a hero who's being venerated, they are venerating a mortal who has passed on that kind of has a, a cophonic association as a result, is associated with the Greek underworld. There are examples of the superstitions in ancient Greece where if someone was to drop food on the floor, that was considered food left for the heroes in the underworld. So I think that's an important distinction for us to have because that distinction is one rule that Heracles almost uniquely breaks. Yeah, that's it. The thing, thing about Heracles is that he is very much on both sides of the divide between hero and god. And even more than the other heroes that we know commonly, he was venerated throughout Greece, whereas a lot of heroes were limited to their city or their geographical area. So, for example, like the 10 original founders of Athens prior to the line of kings that we know from the mythology, they were originally venerated as heroes before Theseus and the kings of Athens became part of the mythology. But that was very much limited to Athens itself. The rest of Greece would not really have had anything to do with them. So with that sort of idea of what a hero would have constituted during the what I would call the archaic period of Greece, which is the 9th century through to the early 5th century, and also classical Greece, which is kind of Greece from that point onwards up until the actions of a certain Alexander the Great. With that definition in mind, let us talk then about Heracles the man and his traits as a hero. So, in most versions of ancient Greek mythology, Heracles is the son of the gods Zeus, who is a storm god, as most people will know, and is also the son of a mortal woman by the name of Alcmene, or Alcmene, also known as Alcmena. I apologise in advance if we get many different uh, phrases wrong in this particular episode, as we tend to do in a lot of the episodes that we have recorded. Alcmene is the daughter of the king Electrion of Tiryns and of Mycenae, which were two powerful cities on the Peloponnese Peninsula. Generally, Heracles has the following traits, and these are either, depending on the tale, gained through his divine parentage, or through another source that we will get into soon. So his main traits are superhuman strength and courage, unrivaled sexual prowess, an excessive appetite, and also, in many works, a fierce temper. So it depends greatly between the author who is discussing him, but a lot of the time Heracles is just as marked by his heroic labours as he is by the rages that he falls into that lead to him to hurt both his enemies and his loved ones alike. In some versions these rages are the work of outside forces and other gods, in some versions they are simply part of his character and being. So throughout most Greek traditions, Heracles is depicted with the following weaponry. So Crofty, fill me in on any here that I've missed. So some of these items were gifted to him by the gods in recognition of his deeds. Others were simply mundane items that were marked out by his exceptional use as a weapon. Or even in some cases that were transformed beyond the mundane through the circumstances of his labour. And we'll get into that shortly. The major piece of weaponry which is usually associated with Heracles in artistic depictions is his lion cloak and helm. Again, there are a couple of versions as to how this was item was procured. According to most sources, it was acquired through the first of his 12 labours, which we will get on to soon. In addition to this, he is also marked out by other items, including a sword that's provided to him by Hermes, a bow and a set of arrows given to him by the sun god Apollo, who was associated with archery, a breastplate that was given to him by the god of smiths, Hephaestus, And perhaps his most iconic weapon, the club. And this club is a purely mundane branch. And perhaps the one thing I would say that is really exceptional about Heracles' use of the club is that there are a few other heroes within Greek mythology that are ever depicted as club wielders. Have I missed anything there, Crofty? I think the one thing that I would add is that there is one depiction of Heracles which gives him a spear and a shield, 
and that is in Hesiod's or mm. Hesiod and Others, Shield of Heracles, in which he fights the son of Ares with a very elaborate shield and a spear. Unfortunately, most, well, significant chunks of which have been lost. The story of that is very much more about the shield, in my mind, and his actual contention with the son of Ares. But yeah, it basically, the shield is covered in so much art that it would actually take up an entire castle wall in reality. Mm. As Crofty went into briefly beforehand, and as Emma Stafford also states in her article Heracles Between Gods and Heroes, Heracles carries many of the same qualifications as other cultural heroes of Greek mythology. So Crofty gave the example of people like Perseus, Theseus, Achilles. So for example, he is descended from the pairing of a god with a mortal woman, as many of those men are. He spends his life performing what are considered heroic labours and siring his own royal bloodlines. And in addition, he is also well known for founding the Olympic Games. Where he probably differs the most, Crofty, I would say, from other heroes, though, is that he ultimately does attain immortality. Yes, I think he is the only one, or one of only maybe two, who mm. attain immortality. Yeah, there is another example that I will get into in a second. So it is due to this kind of dual nature that throughout the ancient Greek world, he was both regularly sacrificed to as a hero, in his more mortal sense, uh, and as a god with the appropriate selection of sacrifices as a result. So as you said, Crofty, I think the only equivalent I can think of would be the god Dionysus, also known as the Roman god Bacchus, who was generally the god of wine and merrymaking, along with another wide variety of attributes as well. One of my favourite gods, feasting an ale. <laughs> Indeed. So Dionysus also had a similar situation where he appeared to be both mortal and immortal, depending on the, the tale. So he was said to have been born twice, first as, the first as the offspring of the gods Zeus and Persephone, and second as the result of the union of Zeus and the mortal woman Semele. 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 Semele, that's the one. So he is a good comparison, and of course, as a son of Zeus, he is a half-brother of Heracles, as are many of the gods that we'll be getting into. So that's the general archetypes, I think, surrounding Heracles. Crofty, is there anything you want to chime in with there? I think I would add two small things. Regarding the sacrifices to Heracles, one common method of sacrificing to him as both a god and a hero meant burning some of the edible meat from a sacrifice to him as a hero while also burning the entrails as a god and so having a smaller feast than one might have if you were just sacrificing to a god. And also, I think the one thing that sort of sets him apart from Dionysus in terms of why he is considered both hero and god, while Dionysus is only considered a god, is that Dionysus was always immortal, as far as I'm aware, whereas Heracles had to die in order to become immortal. And so that's what, gave, what meant that he kept his human aspect he still had to experience death. Mm. So before I want to go into the exact events of Heracles' life, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about where the myth associated with Heracles may have come from, uh, what potential influences from other areas of the world may have led to his development. If you look into a lot of scholarly insight into the topic of Heracles, a lot of the time they relate his myth to more general hunter-hero myths that are associated with Indo-European cultures. So, yeah, the, the archetype of the hunter-hero, usually descended from some form of storm god, is a recurring figure throughout many of the Indo-European regions, throughout Western and Southern and even Eastern Europe. What I found more interesting personally during the course of the reading I was doing, and which appears to have been focused on far more recently, is the possible influence on Heracles that came from the Middle East. So perhaps the best example of a potential influence from the Middle East on the development of Heracles is the Mesopotamian god Ninurta. So, Crofty, if I were to describe to you a being of great strength who wields a lion's skin, a club, and a bow, you would probably think of Heracles, wouldn't you? Yes, that's exactly who I would think of. Hmm. 
But these are in fact all traits of Ninurta in two of the works he appears in, in the Epic of Anzu, and in the other work, The Return of Ninurta to Nippur. Hmm. So that is a very obvious comparison. Um, in early Greek history of the period when Heracles would have been emerging, for example, there is what is known as the Orientalizing period of Greek pottery, where after a long period of geometric motifs appearing in the pottery of the region, there is signs of a clear orientizing influence in pottery designs, and it's theoretically possible that this could have had some influence at least on artistic depictions of Heracles. I'll get into that again a little bit later on another point, but there are also reasons to doubt this, potentially. So in addition to comparisons with Ninurta, another useful parallel I found that could be drawn between Heracles and another figure is with that of Gilgamesh, uh, who again shares many of Heracles' physical traits. He too is a demigod born of the goddess Ninsun, and he is marked by superhuman strength and vitality, tremendous labours that he conducts throughout what would have been considered the breadth of the known world to the peoples of Mesopotamia. And not only that, but there are similarities in some of the aspects of these stories. So, for example, Gilgamesh frequently dons animal skins during his travels. And also, when Gilgamesh is depicted in art, there are some clear parallels in the poses that both figures make. So, in terms of the earliest possible identifiable sign of Heracles' existence, we have a bit of a distinction between the appearances in artwork and in literature. The earliest possible figure that could have in any way connotations associated with Heracles actually dates from the late Greek Bronze Age, and it takes the form of a small number of seals from Mycenae in Greece. This is you know, 12th, 13th century BC, going all the way back to the 16th century BC. And it consists, as I said, of a small number of kind of ring seals depicting men grappling with wild beasts such as lions, men hunting deer from chariots, and there is one seal in particular that does show a man holding a lion by the throat, as if he is strangling it, although he is also wielding a blade in his other hand. So, Crofty, I think that's quite clear that those could be interpreted in a very charitable light as being associated with some of the labours of Heracles. Yes, the uh, lion image in particular sounds quite familiar. Mm. Indeed. I think probably the safest thing you could say on this topic was that this sort of heroic attitude amongst the early Greeks, the Mycenaean period, may have been a later influence on how heroes such as Heracles were depicted, especially in the periods of oral storytelling before literacy was re-established in Greece after the collapse of the Mycenaean cultures in the 12th century BC. But I don't think you can read much more than that into it, quite frankly, because there is no literary source uh, that exists from Mycenae and Greece that gives us any insight into these activities. Greece, after the Mycenaean Age, went through what is often referred to as the Greek Dark Ages. And this is a period where the palace-based economies of the Mycenaean Age, which is marked by local kings ruling areas of the Greek peninsula, after the collapse of these palace-based cultures, Greece reverts very much to local communities which don't have like a unifying culture between them. And it is likely that at some point in this process, the earliest seeds of either Heracles himself or the heroes that were later amalgamated, possibly, into Heracles, that they came into being. By the 8th century BC, when Greece really begins to move away from the geometric artwork in favour again of depictions of human figures uh, on its pottery, by that point scenes are already appearing that can be pretty clearly attributed to Heracles and in some cases many of his labours. This is really transitioning to a period of Greek history known as the Archaic Period rather than the Dark Ages for them. And this is, as you say, when many of the polities of classical Greece came into being. So, with the exception of one labour, which we will get into, almost all of his labours have been found represented in some artistic form or another dating from this period, Crofty. Uh, the only exception which I could find is Labour 5, which makes sense when we'll come to it, because it is an unusual event to try and depict. Yeah, I wouldn't like to try and draw that event, really. 
unfortunately for us, whilst there are rich artistic traditions of Heracles going back even to the earliest parts of archaic Greece, many of the earlier prose and epic poetry-based works of his life and labours from this period just simply have not survived. So the most notable of those that appear to be known of but lost are things such as the Catalogue of Women, as we said before, attributed to Hesiod, which was kind of his bridge between the uh, the more godly antics of the Theog- is it Theogony? Mm, Theogony. Into, uh, is it Works and Days, which is purely to do with the heroic endeavours of mortals. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Probably the most significant epic that has been lost was by an author by the name of Panaeasis, I believe, who in some sources is the source of his 12 labours, specifically the 12 number. We do, however, have a small number of works that date from the early archaic period, such as the works of Homer. In particular, he appears in the Iliad, not in person, because the Iliad is set in the generation of heroes after Heracles. But in that particular work, he is, he is already considered to be a heroic figure uh, and an ideal for other heroes to aspire to, particularly Achilles. This is interesting because the Iliad in its oral form was likely composed somewhere in the 8th century BC, which shows you that his status is already pretty well developed by the time we get to, an or- to a period when oral tradition is starting to be turned into written accounts. In addition to this, he also, as mentioned, appears briefly in the Theogony, where he is again more mentioned uh, as kind of a, a footnote or in passing reference. He also appears very prominently in the Odyssey, which is a work that is also attributed to Homer. There is a great deal of argument over whether it was written by the same person. What is interesting about his depiction in the Odyssey is it is almost a complete flip from his depiction in the Iliad. So in the Iliad, as I said, he is this heroic ideal. In many ways, in the Odyssey, he is a non-ideal for Odysseus. So he not only is he presented as a figure that Odysseus should not emulate, he is presented as appearing in the underworld, where his labours are briefly mentioned. He is also in one of the chapters, I believe it's chapter 21, he is presented simply as a murderer. Not wrong. So in book 21, as I mentioned, uh, we get part of the story of Iphitus, from whom Odysseus once received a bow as a host gift, and how Heracles subsequently killed Iphitus and stole his horses. In comparison to the earlier painting of him as this heroic ideal in Homer's works, here he's not only a brutal killer, as is phrased by the uh, lecture by Dr. Silvio Barr that I mentioned, He's also someone who commits the greatest of possible dishonourable acts, or at least one of the greatest of all possible dishonourable acts, which is to deny the hospitality right and to murder his host. So, yeah, already we are getting very mixed depictions of Heracles, the man and the hero. One of the next kind of archaic sources that we do have, which I think I neglected to mention in our sources, so apologies, were the works and odes of Pindar, who was a influential poet, I believe, in the 6th or 5th centuries BC, who, in complete counterpoint to the Odyssey, presents Heracles as a heroic figure with his negative attributes all but stripped away, completely removed. He is very much considered Pindar's favourite figure, not only to detail, but in terms of the way he kind of brushes over his more negative aspects. So, for example, he does not mention the circumstances of Heracles' death or his apotheosis later on. Apart from these fragments and uh, these smaller appearances in larger accounts, we also have some mentions of Heracles in plays, such as the one we mentioned before as Euripides, We also have two major accounts of his life, which, as we mentioned before, are sort of attributed to Apollodorus of Athens, the pseudo-Apollodorus, and we also have uh, a substantial account by Diodorus of Sicily. From these accounts, we do have a general outline of Heracles' life and his deeds, and 
I wanted to start by saying there is not really considered to be a definitive sole source of Heracles' deeds and life from the ancient Greek world. He appears with many details different between these various accounts we've mentioned that cast him in different lights and involve him in different events. We are going to be following the very general accounts that are given by those two authors I mentioned last. So as I previously mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Heracles is for the most part the son of the king of the gods, Zeus, and the woman Alcmene. Alcmene, I'm still not sure how I'm supposed to say that. Alcmene was the daughter of Electrion, who was king of Tiryns and Mycenae, and she was also the wife of Amphitryon. In addition to being the son of Zeus, in most narratives, Heracles is also descended matrilineally from Zeus through his ancestor Perseus, who was commonly seen as the founder of the ancient Greek city of Mycenae on the Peloponnese Peninsula. The result of this is that Heracles is both Perseus's great-grandson and his half-brother, which puts me in mind of the future armor episode where Fry accidentally becomes his own grandfather. <laughs> mm, or uh, the Red Dwarf episode where Lister is his own father. Yeah, exactly. Lister, Lister another, uh, another hero of epic poetry, so to speak. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. The uh, ancient Greek family trees are sometimes a bit more of a spider web. Yes, exactly. Um, as, uh, as he said of the family tree of Charles II of Spain, um, it's upside down. <laughs> you said that as I was taking a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so that does uh, kind of set the scene for how a lot of the relations within Heracles' family are going to go. And I feel like before we go on to the events of his life, Crofty, we really do need to go into the actions of his immediate ancestors, how they led to the peculiar circumstances of Heracles' birth. A great point to start with, as I said before, is with his ancestor Perseus. So Perseus was popularly considered within Greek culture, the founder of Mycenae, and he, during his time in Greece, begat a number of sons. So these sons were Alcaeus, Sphenolos, Eleos, Mestor, and Electrion. There will be a quiz on these names, by the way. <laughs> I'll start writing them down. <laughs> mm. So of these sons, the oldest, Alcaeus, fathered a son named Amphitryon, and a daughter, Anaxo, who in turn married her uncle, Electrion. To Electrion and Anaxo was born a daughter named Alcmene, and nine sons. I'm not going to name them individually because I don't want to get this to get even more complicated, and we haven't hit the complicated bit yet, I will emphasize. Yeah, it gets worse. <laughs> mm. So in the meantime, Perseus's son, Mester, had fathered a daughter by the name of Hippophoe, who was carried off by Poseidon to the Echinadian Echi Islands. Here, they fathered a son by the name of Taphios, who colonized the island of Taphos. I wonder who he named that after and named his people the Teleboans. So Taphos, in turn, had a son named Terelaus, whom Poseidon, who, again, they are descended from, made immortal by placing a single golden hair upon his head. And Terelaus then, in turn, had six sons. Again, I will not go into the individual names. So, whilst Electrion was king of Tiryns and Mycenae, Terelaus' six sons came to him, and demanded their rightful share in the kingdom by the way of their deceased ancestor, Mester. After Electrion refused, the sons of Terelawas turned around and stole his cattle. So in response to this slight, his sons, Electrion's sons, decided to rescue them, and the result of this was a battle between the two sets of sons, the end result of which was only one son on either side surviving. So of Electrion's sons, Lysimenios, I believe is his name, survived because he was a child and uninvolved in the fighting. And of Terelaus' sons, all save one named Everes were killed, and his reason for surviving is he was guarding the ships. So it was basically a complete massacre on both sides. There were no great survivors amongst them. The remaining Teleboans escaped with the cattle, but Amphitryon, again, was the son of Alcaeus and the nephew of Electrion, stepped in 
and succeeded in ransoming them back. So, in response to this slight and conflict, and the slaying of his sons, Electron planned an expedition to avenge his sons against the Teleboans. In the meantime, he entrusted his kingdom and daughter Alcmene to Amphitryon, on the condition that Amphitryon respect his daughter's virginity until his return. And that indeed is one of Alcmene's great characteristics within these tales, is her chastity. It's a bit of a common one in ancient Greece, that. Indeed it is, but uh, I guess it was a virtue that was highly valued by their society at the time. Mm. One little fly in the ointment here of uh, Electrion's planned expedition, <coughs> of Electrion's planned expedition, when Amphitryon went to return his cattle to him, that he had succeeded in ransoming back, one of the beasts rushed towards the king unexpectedly. So Amphitryon stepped in to try and defend the king by aiming his club at the beast, but the blow rebounded off its horns and stuck Electrion in the face, killing him. So that's somewhat awkward, isn't it? Here is the king who has promised you his daughter and effectively entrusted his kingdom to you, and now you have accidentally killed him. Yeah, that, that's going to be a tough one to explain to the wife. Indeed, and uh, his wife wasn't angry with him, but it appears that the circumstances of Electrion's death did allow another of Perseus' sons that we mentioned before, Svenelos, to seize the throne and to exile Amphitryon and Alcmene to Thebes. And it is here that Heracles came to be born. So, the siring of Heracles follows this general form in both Apollodorus and Theodorus's accounts. Depending on which of them is telling the tale, Alcmene is now either married or betrothed in some way to Amphitryon, but she makes either the final marriage or the consummation of the marriage contingent on his avenging of the deaths of her brothers. Amphitryon indeed sets out to do so, and in order to do this, he enlists the help of Creon, who is the king of Thebes. So there are varying forms of exactly how uh, Creon agrees to help him. There's one particular version where I believe this comes from Apollodorus. Creon says he will help him after he completes the labour of catching a vixen that was fated to never be caught and that was terrorising the land. Off the top of my head, the way that Amphitryon fixes this is he finds a dog that is fated to always catch what it hunts, which creates something of a paradox. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. And this is such a paradox that in the end, Zeus steps in and turns both animals to stone. Which I guess is one way to get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Just change the rules entirely. Indeed. So, in this version, uh, Amphitryon is rewarded for this deed by Creon, who agrees to help him with avenging the deaths of his wife's brothers. In some versions of the myth, Creon also purifies Amphitryon of the dishonour of killing Electrion as well. So Amphitryon gathers his allies, and he goes forth and he sacks the islands of the Teleboans. Although it is specified that their chief stronghold of Taphos he is unable to take, for the simple reason that this is where the immortal Terraloas resides. Remember what I said about the golden hair in the head? Yeah, yeah. This remains the case until Terraloas' daughter, Camepho, having fallen in love with Amphitryon, plucks the golden hair from Terraloas' head, which kills him and allows Amphitryon to take the city. As her reward for betraying the city to him, Amphitryon has her put to death. <laughs> okay. For the, for the dishonour of betraying both her father and her city. In his favour, of course. Yeah. So, with there now being no ruler of the Teleboans, this I the islands were given over to Amphitryon's companions, and he went off and returned home. Meanwhile, as he is returning home, a certain uh, Zeus, I don't know if you've heard of this guy before and what he gets up to, um, comes to the city of Thebes and assumes the likeness of Amphitryon. After convincing uh, Alcamene of the details of Amphitryon's war against Tarbones, 
that her brothers have indeed been avenged, he goes to bed with her. So in most versions of the retelling, he deliberately extends the night to be three times as long as normal in order to delay Amphitryon's arrival. Or, I believe this is more the case in Diodorus's version, he simply wanted to increase the length of the intercourse in order to increase the strength of the child that would be born. Because that's that makes that that kind of, that obviously that doesn't make sense by our own understanding of intercourse nowadays and how children are conceived. But you can understand an ancient Greek society believing that would very much be the case. Yeah, there's a certain logic mm. to it. It's logical. It's incorrect, but it is kind <laughs> of logical. Yeah, especially when you're dealing with gods. So. Mm. So as I kind of said before, Apollodorus doesn't go into a great detail as to Zeus's motivations for doing so, but we do have a couple of other sources. Um, as I mentioned, Diodorus, in Diodorus, uh, Zeus's act is expressly done for the sake of procreation, rather than as an act of love or lust in the case of many of the other women that he slept with. Indeed, later in the same telling, um, he goes on to say that after the might and accomplishments of Heracles, Zeus actually stopped his intercourse with mortals so as to avoid any future descendants of his being less worthy than their illustrious predecessors. And I have a quote to that effect. It appears, then, that Zeus began to begat human beings with the ancestors of Alcmene and ceased with her. That is, he stopped with her his intercourse with mortal women since he had no hope that he would beget in after times one who would be worthy of his former children and was unwilling to have the better followed by the worse. Basically, no one else is going to top this. Yes. Those are two possible uh, versions of Zeus's motivations. The, the other version I have is uh, what I'd call Zeus being Zeus, which is um, in an account related to us by Hesiod, which is included in the Shield of Heracles, it is the desire of Zeus for, quote, the neat ankled daughter of Electrion that leads him to do his deed and disguise himself as Amphitryon, who, quote, surpassed the tribe of womankind in beauty and height, and in wisdom none vied with her of those whom mortal women bore of the union with mortal men. Her face and dark eyes wafted such charm as comes from the golden Aphrodite. So that's her, a bit more of a, a Zeus-oriented uh, explanation for his interest in Heracles' mother. After Zeus is finished with his deed, Amphitryon does indeed return to Thebes and greet his wife, only to be somewhat surprised when she greets him with what is described as no great ardour. After asking her why this is the case, she replies that he had come the previous night and slept with her. So Amphitryon thus learned the truth of the matter. In time, Alcmene gave birth to two sons, the oldest by a day being Heracles, sired by Zeus, and the younger Iphicles, Heracles' half-brother, who was sired by Amphitryon. So according to both the accounts of Apollodorus and uh, Diodorus, even before the moment of his birth, Heracles, as with many of the descendants of Zeus, or the mortal descendants of Zeus, I should say, had earned the wrath of Zeus's wife Hera. This begins even with the timing of Heracles' birth. So around this time, Zeus had decreed that the very next descendant of Perseus who would be born would become the king of Mycenae, which, as I remind you, was at the time held by Svenelos, who had usurped the throne from Amphitryon and his wife. Now, logically speaking, Heracles should have been the heir for the simple reason that um, Amphitryon was directly sired by Perseus's oldest son. So, logically, he would be first in line. And uh, indeed, it seemed like he was also likely to meet the conditions of what Zeus had proclaimed for the next ruler of Mycenae. However, Hera intervened, and according to the version, she either delayed Heracles' birth or she deliberately sped up the birth of Svenelos's son. The result being that Eurystheus was born first and became heir and then king of Mycenae. So before he is even born, Hera has denied Heracles the rightful throne of Tyrins and Mycenae. 
So from this point onwards, in another tale related to us by Theodorus, there is indeed another encounter between Hera and Heracles as a baby, with the difference being this time Hera is largely unaware of Heracles' identity. Fearing Hera's revenge for the incident involving Heracles' birth, Alcmene exposes Heracles to die in a field, which we are told become, is later known as the Field of Heracles. Both Hera and Athena manage to approach the exposed child unaware that it is Heracles, and amazed by his vigour, Athena convinces Hera to offer the babe her breast. However, Heracles, being who he was, suckled so fiercely that he caused great harm to Hera, who hurled the babe from her. So according to this version of the tale, this is actually the source of Heracles' superhuman strength by being suckled by Hera's milk. Another version of this tale also proclaims this to be the source of the Milky Way, which would have been considered simply another constellation in these times, and that it was said to be the squirt of Hera's milk that was flung into the sky as she hurled Heracles from her. Afterwards, Athena then retrieves Heracles, uh, probably uh, brushes him off a little bit, I assume. Checks for bruises and broken bones. Mm -hmm. And then returns him to his mother. So after this, Hera's enmity would continue. Uh, I believe Diodorus actually does kind of point to Heracles suckling too fiercely as one of the main reasons for her dislike of him, which uh, says a lot of how, how fickle the Greek gods really are. Yeah, <laughs> considering some of the things that Hera does later to get back at him as well. Indeed, indeed. And immediately following on from this event, we have a story that I think most people are going to be quite uh, familiar with in relation to Heracles. This is the story of the two serpents that were sent to dispatch him in his cradle. So this is recounted to us by both Apollodorus and Diodorus. So Hera dispatches two serpents in order to kill Heracles in his cradle. However, there is an alternative version. So Apollodorus does mention this first tale, but he also details that the sender of the serpents was not in fact Hera. In one of the versions he mentions, Amphitryon sends the serpents. And this is not done to kill Heracles, it is done so that Amphitryon can discover which of the two boys have been born is actually his son. That could have ended very badly if they went for the wrong one. But as to be expected, Iphicles, being terrified by the creatures, recoils from them and cries and kicks off his blanket. But Heracles simply seizes the neck of each snake and proceeds to strangle them. So it is definitively shown to Amphitryon that <laughs> Iphicles is in fact his son. As Heracles grows up, according to Apollodorus, he is taught chariot riding by his stepfather, wrestling by a man by the name of Autolycos, archery by a man by the name of Eurytos, fencing by Castor, and lyre playing by a Phoebean man called Linos, who was the brother of Orpheus, who uh, some people familiar with Greek mythology may know as a legendary musician and poet. It is during this tuition that Heracles kills a man for the first time. And this is when he is a youth, I'll remind you. Some of the versions of these give more details than others. The general understanding I have is that Heracles proves to be a poor student with the lyre, and he comes into conflict with Linos. In Apollodorus's version, Heracles uh, ends up killing the musician after the musician starts the quarrel by striking him. Not surprisingly, Heracles was, as a result, brought up on a charge of murder. But he claimed to be acting in self-defence according to the laws of the time, and as a result, he was acquitted. However, Amphitryon, worrying that he may indeed cause further incidents like this, instead sends him away to tend his stepfather's herds, where he remained until he was 18. I did some looking into this, because we actually get a description of Heracles' size in one ways, or at least his height. So, Crofty, Heracles is described as growing to the great size and height of four cubits. Now, the cubit is a measurement throughout European and Middle Eastern history 
that has varied greatly between cultures. The version that I found in this case is just slightly less than one half of a metre. Yeah, that uh, sounds about right. I've heard it as about a foot and a half, so mm. about evens out. Yeah, which means that Heracles, this great towering uh, beast of a man, is probably somewhere in the region about six foot two. Which is very tall for the time. Indeed, that's what I'm trying to get at. Is <laughs> I would give this an example of like human beings until quite recently uh, in many like, early urbanized societies are not particularly tall. So uh, to give a an example, even in the early 20th century, there was a boxer by the name of Jack Johnson, who I mostly know of because there's a documentary about him because he was the first uh, black world heavyweight champion and he was a very colorful figure. But in his time, he was described as the as a giant. I believe he was called the Ethiopian giant, which is a bit racist, but um, because he was American. But anyway, he was, I think, about six foot one. So it does show up until quite recent times. Many uh, figures who were considered incredibly tall by modern standards would just be a moderately tall person or in, in some cultures a normal height person. We've seen a few people, well, I say we've seen, the world has seen people as high as seven feet nowadays. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we know the tallest man who ever lived was eight foot eleven, so we're getting into Goliath territories at that point. Yeah, and yeah, six foot four is you know, not uncommon these days. Mm, exactly. But uh, as a five foot eleven man, I'm going to move this conversation <laughs> on quickly. <laughs> So, during this time, Her Heracles remains with his father's herds until the age of 18. And it is according to Apollodorus that in this time frame he fought and slew his first great beast. I'm not going to go into great detail on the details of this for the simple reason that it is thought that this is, uh, that is not kind of a widely considered part of his mythology. And indeed, it seems to mix up some details with one of his later labours. It does, however, involve another event which needs mentioning. So. During this time, there was a lion known as the Lion of Kepharion, or Kepharion, who was menacing both his stepfather's herds and those of the king of the Thespii, who was helpfully named Thespios. During the course of this hunt, Thespios entertained the young Heracles, and every night that the hunt continued and that he would return, he would arrange it so that one of his fifty daughters, who all looked all but identical, would sleep with Heracles. Heracles believed that they were all the same woman, and as a result, he was able to sire a child on each of these women. The reason given for this in Apollodorus' account is that Thespios wished to sire strong children from Heracles. That's the simple reason given. Did Thespios know of Heracles' ancestry at this point? It is unfortunately not mentioned in Apollodorus' account. It may well have been. Yeah. But then also a, a six foot two man strong enough to fight a lion is also generally quite valued anyway back then. So upon returning from this hunt, after successfully slaying the beast, Heracles was met by heralds from the king of the minions. At the time, the city of Thebes, which is where he's grown up and where Amphitryon was exiled to, was in fact paying regular tribute to the min minions who lived at neighbouring Orchomenos, which is another city on uh, the Boeotian, I think it's called, peninsula. Boeotian, I think. Boeotian, I, that's the I one. I could be wrong on that as well. Yeah, well, Greek is not our first language, unfortunately, <laughs> so we apologise to anyone out there. Just uh, let's copy and paste the last disclaimer from every other episode that we have used <laughs> at this point. At this time, Thebes was paying regular tribute to Orchomenos and the Minions, and this was a result of their previous defeat by their king, Aginos. And specifically, the tribute list given by Apollodorus is that 100 cattle each year were being gifted to these peoples by Thebes, and it was to continue for 20 years. Not only that, but I believe in Diodorus's account, they had also stripped Thebes of any useful weapons. So when Heracles happens to come across these heralds who are journeying to receive these tributes, he responds by horribly mutilating them, 
for what he perceives as the offence against his city. He cuts off their ears, their noses, and their hands, and he ties them around their necks. And it is these that he tells them to take to Erginos, and that this is to be the only tribute he is to receive. Erginos, rather unsurprisingly, responds by marching with his army against Thebes. In both Apollodorus's account and in Diodorus's accounts, uh, Heracles and the youth of the city end up doing battle with the rival king. In Diodorus's account, King Creon of Thebes is prepared to hand over Heracles to Aginos. However, Heracles, on his own initiative, rallies the young men of the city and, realising that the enemy have not actually taken the arms and armour that have been left in the various temples of Thebes, retrieve those and equip them. So in both accounts, Heracles is victorious and Aginos and his men are slain. As a reward, Creon gives him not only the hand of his daughter Megara, but also grants him control of the city as if it was his own. So after Heracles had married Megara, she went on to bear him three sons, and alongside this, Creon gave his younger daughter to Iphicles, who already had one son by the name of, of uh, Aeolus, and had, went on to have two more children. At this point, things are looking, I think we have to say, pretty rosy for Heracles. He's already conducted himself in several heroic acts, and he's also now effectively the heir to Thebes. Done quite well for himself. Indeed he has, for uh, a young, divinely... Uh, I was going to say a young man who dragged himself up, but for a young, <laughs> divinely sired man who was the uh, the son of an exiled heir to a throne, mm. um, he didn't have to pull himself that far, admittedly. Yeah, he, he starts out with nothing, just a small loan of godly power from his father. Yeah, uh, yes, a small loan of a million godly powers. <laughs> That's not a reference to anything in real life at all. Yes, Crofty. So things are looking pretty rosy for Heracles at this moment. But it is unfortunately at this moment, according to whichever version you read, that calamity befalls him in one of two potential ways. I think I need to do a little bit of back, uh, a little bit of a back step to explain something here. In some versions of the tale, when Hera intervened to change the, day of, the date of birth of Heracles so that another man would become heir to Tyrins and Mycenae, in one version, I believe it is Diodorus's version, I may be wrong, Zeus's response is to decree that Heracles will conduct 12 labours. And if he completes them, he will be gifted immortality. So it's kind of his recompense for no longer being the heir to the city. In some versions, it is simply the case that this debt is called due, because whilst uh, these works, well, whilst the news of Heracles' works, and in particular his deeds at Thebes, are now reverberating throughout Greece and becoming the source of great acclaim, it is stated that the now king of Tyrins a man that we previously mentioned by the name of Eurystheus, steps in and thinks, I need to put the kibosh on this one. And it's at this point that he demands that Heracles begin these labours the gods have ordained for him. In Diodorus's version, this is the point where he is struck by a madness. This madness differs between versions. In Ap Apollodorus's version, this whole chain of events is very different. According to Apollodorus, this madness which strikes Heracles does not come because he is divinely ordained to in indulge in these labours or anything to do with Eurystheus. Instead, he is struck down by this madness by Hera. And Crofty, do you want to enliven us as to the details of what this madness results in? Yes. It is definitely not Disney-friendly. No. <laughs> <laughs> The madness in which Hera casts upon Heracles causes him to kill Megara, not Megara, to fling both of his children and two of Iphicles' children into the fire, killing them. Then, after which, he comes to his senses and is guilt-ridden 
by what he has done. Apollodorus says that he was purified by Thespius, though it doesn't really go into detail on what purified means in this case. Yeah, I had trouble I had trouble finding that as well, I must admit. Yeah, I assume that that would be something that would be well understood at the time. I, I think the vague sense I got from reading the sources, it meant absolved him of his dishonourable act. Yeah, because they understood that it was a madness that was placed upon him, and rather than an actual premeditated murder, I suppose yeah. they could do that. Um, but Heracles then chose to condemn himself to exile. And so in his exile, um, Heracles travels to Delphi and asks the oracle where he should dwell and how he should atone for his sins. And the oracle then tells him that he should go and present himself to Eurystheus for 12 years and perform the 10 labors that Eurystheus would impose on him, but that after completing these tasks, he would then attain immortality. I think one useful thing to point out as well from this meeting, uh, occurring, according to different versions of the story, this is actually a point up to which Heracles has not actually received his name of Heracles. I believe in some versions his name before this point is, is it Alchemies? Alcides, I think Alcides, it is. that's the one. So up until this point, his name is often given as Alcides, and he is effectively rechristened Heracles by the Pythia at this point. Um, there's other versions where it happens much later, I believe, after he's completed his labours. Hmm. Yeah, and there's a slight uh, ironic aspect to that name in that it means the glory of Hera, and it was bestowed on him due to the great glory that he would attain as a result of Hera scheming against him. So the alternative version of this that was given by Diodorus has Eurystheus summon Heracles to perform labours for him prior to any madness. Um, Heracles chooses to ignore this initial summons, and Zeus then commands him to submit himself to Eurystheus. Heracles, again, rather than directly obeying both the king and his father, he instead chooses to go to the oracle and ask the oracle for advice. And the oracle then also tells him to present himself to Eurystheus for the completion of 12 labours. And that if he completes them, immortality would be his reward. However, even after the oracle and Zeus and Eurystheus commanding him, he is still too proud to submit himself to Eurystheus. And he is described by Diodorus as he fell into a despondency of no ordinary kind, which Hera takes advantage of and sent upon him a frenzy, and in his vexation of soul he fell into a madness. As the affliction grew on him, he lost his mind and tried to slay Aeolus. Aeolus was his nephew by um, Iphicles. Yep. Um, and so after Aeolus escaped, he instead shot his bow and killed both of his children. Um, when he comes to his senses, he grieves what he's done, and he chooses, after all this, to finally submit himself to Eurystheus and complete the labours. The third and final version of the madness that we'll mention here was told by the playwright Euripides in his tragedy The Madness of Heracles. In this version, um, Amphitryon states that these events are occurring after the twelfth labour. Heracles has returned from his labours. He has found that Megara's father has been overthrown by a man named Lycus, and who Lycus is about to have Megara and her sons executed. Heracles returns in the nick of time, because that's the appropriately dramatic way to do things, <laughs> and kills Lycus. And it's after this that, at a celebratory dinner, Hera sends Lyssa, the goddess of madness, to give Heracles a hallucination. Heracles proclaims, in his hallucination, that he will slay Eurystheus. He then acts out the ride to Eurystheus's castle, and in this he kills Megara and his sons, believing that they are Eurystheus and Eurystheus's sons, before Athena appears and subdues him and allows Amphitryon to tie him up, at which point he then wakes, comes to his senses, and grieves what he's done. Um, the play basically ends with Heracles and Theseus leaving for Athens, where he'll atone for his sins in a different way. Mm -hmm. 
So it gives some more detail on the madness, but then puts it in a completely different context. Yeah, that's, I think as we said before, there isn't really a canonical version, uh, unfortunately, of his whole uh, of his whole pursuit. And in fact, many of the scholars I read kind of celebrated the idea and said it's a mistake to try and impose a single version. Yeah, but what's interesting, I think, like that's where the series of events where Megara is killed. That's that's where that Fred appears into his version of the story. And the other two versions, Megara actually survives for much longer. So is this where we hand over and begin the labours themselves then? Not quite yet, Crofty. Not not so fast, <laughs> Crofty. No. Um I wanted to just quickly mention before we start talking about the twelve labours of Heracles, which is the uh big a crowd-pleasing event that we are all here for, I'm sure. I thought I'd just want to mention a couple of things around the construction of the labours. So, the big thing for us to mention here is that different sources on Heracles do change the exact order of some of the labours. The most notable examples for us that we're going to have today is that um, the accounts of Apollodorus and Diodorus are slightly different in terms of order. So, we're going to be following the order laid out Apollodorus just for the sake of consistency and so that you can follow along at home. The one thing I also want to point out is that the there's some conflict as to whether you know the canonical number of labours, which in some versions initially 10, eventually 12, in most versions originally 12 and always 12, in some of the earlier sources associated with Heracles, the exact number of feats and labours that are attributed to him do vary quite wildly. So um it's not really until the 3rd century BC that the exact labours and numbers seem to become fully canonised. Although I did find some contradictory information on that. So um, the lost work of Panaeasis that I mentioned before is mentioned by some scholars as a potential source of the 12 number. Of the authors that mention any of the more than one of the labours, Pindar is probably the best example. He mentions uh, the first labour, the third labour, and... I believe, the fifth labour. He may, may mention a couple more as well, but it's not really is just in Apollodorus and Diodorus that we get these definitive lists that we're going to go into now. And one argument I also saw, Crofty, is that there isn't really a theme that runs through the labours. There is occasionally labours back-to-back that resemble each other in terms of the challenge given to Heracles. There isn't really a thematic progression for them, is there? No, there's a few sort of common aspects between certain labours and there is the one major common aspect that Eurystheus couldn't benefit personally from yes. them. But those are the only real those are the only real commonalities that we see throughout. So hmm. But yes, that's all I wanted to make clear, folks. So now we're gonna go over to Crofty for the first three labours. Yes, and so we have the main event, round one. <laughs> <laughs> the first labour, the Lion of Nemea, does fit into the more modern idea of a heroic deed, in that it is to go and slay a beast that has been killing livestock and kidnapping the common folk. And so it does make sense in the Deodorus version where... Eurystheus first summoned Heracles to complete the labours before he had anything to atone for. It's definitely something that a king or local warlord would want dealing with. So Nemea was a small city to the west of Tiryns. It was close to the border between the Argolis region, where Tiryns and Mycenae were, and Corinth. The lion itself lived in the caves of the nearby Mount Tritos, which is about halfway between Mycenae and Nemea, and it regularly ventured out to feed on livestock, kidnap young women, and kill any man sent to rescue them. Unlike the lion that was previously mentioned, this lion was one of the descendants of Typhon, who I believe we discussed in episode two, way back when. Mm, indeed we did. The 100-headed dragon and Echidna, the half-serpent, half-woman who was said to live in Tartarus. Apollodorus describes the Nemean lion as the child of Typhon and Echidna, whereas Hesiod, in his Theogony, claims that it was the grandchild 
of Typhon and Echidna, and that its parents were Orthos and the Chimera, who were the first and the fourth children of Typhon and Echidna. Hmm. So once again, the uh, unusually shaped family trees. Yeah, I mean, um, it's also, I think we should mention, a tradition within uh, most of ancient Greek mythology is that almost every monstrous creature, uh, with the possible exception of maybe the giants and the titans, almost every other creature is usually sired by a combination of Echidna and Typhus. They are respectively referred to as the mother and the father of monsters, and at least one of them is usually involved in the ancestry Mm. of every monster that we'll see. So, despite being descended from Typhon, who had nearly killed Zeus previously, or perhaps because he'd been descended from Typhon, Hera herself raised the Nemean lion, and sources including Hesiod and the poet Callimachus claim that Hera set the lion on the Nemea region and the Argolis region as a punishment for believing that the local humans had seen her bathing in a nearby spring, which she bathed in once every year. Hera had been known at that time as the patron goddess of the Argolis region, and so once the people had been suitably punished by a few livestock thefts and murders and etc. from the lion, she then needed the lion to be removed, and so whether Heracles succeeded or Heracles failed, it would still benefit her by rescue, either rescuing the people who considered her their patron or by getting rid of Heracles. As Heracles travelled to Nemea, he rested one night at the farm of a man named Molochus. That night, Molochus had been planning to sacrifice a ram to Zeus. So according to Apollodorus, Heracles convinced Molochus to wait 30 days. If he returned victorious, then together they would sacrifice the ram to Zeus. If he did not return, Heracles asked that Molochus then sacrifice the ram to Heracles as a hero, which, as we discussed earlier, would be a particularly important distinction to Molochus, because if Heracles came back alive and they sacrificed to Zeus, Molochus would get to eat the meat. If Heracles was dead, then Molochus was just wasting an entire ram. The most detailed account that we have of Heracles' encounter um, actually comes from the poet Theocritus in one of his idyls. In this poem, Heracles tells a man named Phileus of his exploits. He explains that he found the lion's hunting grounds where the pallor of fear hung over the farmsteads and no man worked with his oxen or laboured in the fields. For almost a month, he tracked the lion around these hunting grounds with the lion quite regularly circling the region and travelling through a pass at the Tretos Mountain, which was quite narrow at both ends. After four weeks of this, so with his deadline that he promised to Molochus approaching, Heracles had to force the lion into a corner so that he could battle it. And so he created a rock slide at one end of the pass in order to block it off. He then hid in the bushes by the roadside until late in the day, and when the lion attempted to come through the pass, it found itself cornered. Once the lion was cornered, Heracles leapt out from the bushes and attempted to shoot it. And it was here that he found out that the lion's skin was impenetrable, as the first and the second arrow flew true, but they bounced off of the skin between the lion's ribs. So as the lion pounced, Heracles first folded his cloak around his remaining arrows as a makeshift shield, as it's unknown why he wasn't carrying shields, the shield that he had in his earlier battles, and he counterattacked with his club. He managed to strike the charging lion on his skull, which shattered the club, but managed to stun the lion, and the lion fell. Heracles took advantage of this momentary weakness. He dropped his bow and his arrows. He managed to straddle the lion, pin the lion's forepaws to the ground with his feet, and strangle the lion to death from behind. While Heracles hadn't known about the lion's impenetrable skin, he did know that the lion's claws could cut through anything. He knew that he couldn't let the lion's paws free or let the lion turn because then his claws would finish him off. However, the labour was not to simply kill the lion, but to bring back the lion's hide. While the Apollodorus version simply states that Heracles carried the lion on his shoulders to Eurystheus, 
Diodorus Siculus and Theocritus both state that Heracles put the skin of the lion about himself, covering his whole body due to its great size, and could then use it as protection against future dangers. Diodorus Siculus doesn't explain how he managed to skin a lion with an impenetrable hide, <laughs> whereas Theocritus states that a god advised Heracles that the claws could cut through anything, oh. and so to use the claws to skin the lion. And so while earlier we had one answer to, to the riddle of a predator that can catch anything and a prey that can escape anything, mm. here we have an answer to the unstoppable force and the immovable object. Yes, uh, um, it seems that the unstoppable force wins. Yeah, though I am willing to bet that there is another story somewhere in Greek mythology where the immovable object wins yeah. in a similar situation. After using the claws to skin the lion, he fashioned it into a protective outfit and then returned to Molochus on the 30th day when Molochus had all but given up on seeing him again. And so together they sacrificed the ram to Zeus and presumably had quite a good feast. Hmm. According to Ptolemy, Heracles also then held a small burial for one finger that he had lost in the fight with the lion, entombing it underneath a stone lion which then became an established practice for the tombs of heroes. Hmm. Following all of this, he returns to Eurystheus, and Apollodorus states that he was amazed at Heracles' manhood, and henceforth forbade him to enter the city, but to exhibit the fruits of his labours at the city gates. And he had his herald, Coprius, give Heracles his next commands from the city gates, and observe any evidence of each completed labour. And at this time, in his fear, Eurystheus then commissions a bronze jar beneath the earth within his palace in which he could hide should Heracles ignore his commands and enter the city. Yep, we'll be seeing that again, folks, don't worry. Oh, we will. <laughs> yep, Chekhov's gun. Yeah. <laughs> Although um, it's a weird one where it's Chekhov's gun, but it's not Chekhov's gun within the same story. <laughs> so maybe that's a bad comparison. I don't know. Well, you know, the rules of literature hadn't really been fully formed at this point. Mm. And there were a lot of, you know, a lot of different sources sort of coming together to this history. So we assume from the various... Ignore what I said. Yeah, I was, saying, I was just going to say, oh, I'm, I, just, I, conti I, just continue. <laughs> I, yeah, I, had a, I had a train of thought, it got derailed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> train of thought, it got stopped at the station. <laughs> so on to the second labour. The second labour was in a similar vein to the first, which was to slay the Hydra of Lernaea. Lernaea was still within the Argolis region, which was roughly four miles from the city of Argos itself, according to the Roman writer Pausinias, and it was close to marshlands that were fed by the river Aminome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. You know that scene in Finding Nemo where he's trying to say an, an anemone? Yes. <laughs> I, I... Which, as you said it, my eyes hit the word, and I was like, oh. Amimone. Right, a, yeah. Amimone. The hydra was thought to dwell close to the spring of the river. Hesiod states that the hydra was the third child of Typhon and Echidna, and that the hydra was also raised by Hera. And, in fact, some translations say that it was suckled by Hera. As a slight callback to earlier on when Heracles was a baby. Yeah. As she chose to use the Hydra to deliberately set it upon Heracles. Hesiod simply describes this as Heracles killed the Hydra with his pitiless bronze, joined by war loving Aeolios, through the plans of Athena, leader of the war host. So here, Hesiod doesn't describe the Hydra's form. No mention of multiple heads, no mention of it being a serpent or a dragon or anything similar, simply that it is a child, Typhon, and Echidna. The generally accepted form is that of a water serpent with multiple heads, mm. though the number does vary quite a bit between writers. So Pausinias, who was a Roman travel writer, and so was like more sceptical than poets or earlier Greek historians, believe that while it was larger and more venomous than other water snakes, that it only had one head. 
he claimed that the first description by Peasander of Chimeros gave it multiple heads in order to make it scarier and to make his poem more memorable. What a rotter, wanting to make his poem entertaining. <laughs> That's not what poetry's for. <laughs> but, uh, there's not even a single school child annoyed by having to read this. <laughs> I uh, unfortunately can't find any of Peer Sanders' works to tell you whether his no. poetry was entertaining or memorable. Mm. Um, they don't seem to have survived. Well, can't have been, can't have been, can't have been that entertaining then. Oh, they were so entertaining that someone was jealous and destroyed them all. They were too dangerous to survive. <laughs> sorry, that's, sorry, go on. That's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> on a serious note, and back to the uh, less entertaining but quite interesting histories by Apollodorus. <laughs> Apollodorus described the Hydra as originally having nine heads, one of which was immortal. Diodorus Siculus claims that it has 100 necks, each bearing the head of a serpent sprouting from a single body. And this version is also then supported by the Roman poet Ovid, who has Heracles himself describe the Hydra as, Growing from wounds I gave, at first it had 100 heads, and every time I severed one head from its neck, there grew two in place of one, by which its strength increased. This creature then, outbranching with strong serpents, sprung from death and thriving on destruction I destroyed. So that version is a bit uh, boastful mm. on Heracles' part, uh, given that he is trying to intimidate a shape-shifting serpent god. Yes. Uh, but also generally accurate to the Diodorus version of events. And according to Diodorus as well, the increasing number of heads meant that the Hydra was considered to be invincible. Mm. So the description of its strength increasing with each head is also quite fitting. Yeah, there are quite a few creatures in uh, the course of his labours who are what we would call invincible but not immortal. They're they're invulnerable to harm and have to be dispatched by some like physical harm and have to be dispatched by some other means. Yeah, Heracles uh, proves that they're not as immortal as everyone thought. So when Heracles finds the Hydra, he used fire arrows in order to drive it from its lair before attempting to grapple with it, which is uh, probably not the best way to fight a serpent. No. <laughs> In the end, it does seem to work. At this point, a large crab, which has been sent by Hera, tried to aid the Hydra by biting at Heracles' foot. But Heracles quite easily dispatched that by smashing it with his new club. According to Apollodorus, Heracles then attempts to smash the Hydra's heads with his club, which doesn't seem the uh, easiest way of going about defeating serpents. Whereas Diodorus and Ovid and others do specify that he was severing the heads with a blade. Either way, more heads grew where each one was destroyed, until Heracles ordered Aeolios to light a brand and to cauterize each wound as Heracles severs or destroys a head. Apollodorus and Diodorus Siculus imply that this was Heracles' idea, but as I mentioned earlier, Hesiod claims that this was the plan of Athena. So uh, Apollodorus and Diodorus are giving Heracles a bit more credit than earlier writers were. Yeah, I mean, uh, Athena is often depicted alongside them in some of the early archaic depictions on pottery of the, uh, of the labour, so that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. So according to Apollodorus, the final immortal head was chopped off and Heracles buried it under a large rock beside the road between Lernaea and the city of Elias. Heracles then dips his arrows in the gallbladder of the Hydra's body, which covers them in the most potent venom in the world, and which will become very important later on. There's various descriptions of the Hydra where its poison is in its blood, where its poison comes from its teeth, from its breath. Yeah, in, in Diodorus it's his, it's his venom, for example. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, Generally, there was a lot of poison in this thing. <laughs> and one poem had Heracles describe his arrows as sorrow-bringing, which definitely fits later on. So in Apollodorus' version, upon returning to Aristheus, Aristheus proclaims that this labour was failed, as he had help from Aeolios, mm. and so adds an extra labour. So in Apollodorus' version, we're now on 11 labours, 
whereas Deodorus, it's always started as 12. Yeah, it's not discounted in his version simply because, yeah, there's no reason to discount it. Yeah. Also, as an interesting little side note, just because I found this and I quite, quite liked it, Linnea later became the genus name of a group of parasites, which are known as anchor worms, mm. which are a worm with several hooks at one end that latch onto fish. And so they do bear quite a distinct resemblance to some oh, early yeah. depictions of the Hydra as a serpent-like body with many heads sprouting from it. Oh, wow, yeah. I've just uh, looked up an image on Google <laughs> Images, and uh, I wouldn't want that on me if I was a fish. No, <laughs> no. It's a bit nasty. Mm. <laughs> so we have two labors completed, or one complete and one failed, depending on which version you prefer. Uh, the next two labors were a bit less in Heracles' wheelhouse as killing monsters. I'm going to work from Apollodorus's order, and so the next labor will be capturing the Keranesian hind. And so in, in this labor, it was specified that Heracles must bring the animal back alive, which he's not really done with most things he's encountered at this stage. Yeah, it's... it's uh... Strangle, set fire to, hit with club. Um, uh, beat to death with a liar. Yeah. Uh, kill an entire army. Yeah. Yep. You know, so the, the first two were relatively easy. Really? <laughs> Throw a kid in the fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Keep, keeping things alive. <laughs> and a new experience for Heracles. So the Keranesian hind, also known as the Keranesian doe, was a female deer with large golden antlers, which, outside of myth, is not found in European deer. Mm. Some authors say that it must be a stag, because it has antlers, whereas there is also some evidence to suggest that it could in fact be a reindeer. Yes, I saw that account as well, yeah. Yeah, as female reindeers do have antlers. Well, it, well it's not uncommon for some elements of Greek mythology don't actually... Uh, represent animals that would have been alive in greece at the time so for example the first labor was a lion but there are very very few lions in ancient greece plenty in the middle east but not in uh, ancient greece so that's another possible influence there on the story yeah and in fact in pindar's olympian odes which were poems celebrating the panhellenic games it mentions that heracles when hunting the golden horned doe had to travel to the land beyond the cold blasts of Boreas, which is the north wind. Oh, Hyperborea. Yeah. Yes. I've encountered Hyperborea before because it was in my Druids video that I made way back a whole a whole 11 months ago, which uh, before <laughs> wow. the end times, and um, <laughs> is, is like a, a metaphorical place uh, beyond the northern edges of the world, basically. I was wondering if it was... An old name for Scandinavia. No, there, there has been. It's hilarious. Um, hyper, actually, Hyperborea. That's, I read an entire detailed argument how Hyperborea was like part of the Outer Hebrides, um, ignoring the fact that in the various different stories Hyperborea appears in, um, it just seems to progressively move further north the longer, oh. like the more of the world that the Greeks become aware of. I remember that part of the video now where you were discussing that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry, sorry. Continue. No, no, it's quite, it's all right. That actually gives a bit more information than I had. Because, mm. yeah, I'd, I'd basically been assuming that Hyperborea, in this case, represented um, Finland or Scandinavia. Or just, just somewhere metaphorically northwards. Yeah. I believe, I believe there are reindeer in Finland, aren't there? I am right about that. Uh, the Santa Claus, that counts. <laughs> that, that might be why I'm thinking it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I ignore, ignore all of my claims regarding the distribution of various deer. Mm. Because yeah, I'm 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 not a deerologist. No. There's probably a smarter word for that, but never mind. <laughs> nope, it's a deerologist. Yep. So the actual story that I was that we were going to tell. <laughs> After that lengthy, lengthy digression, sorry. <laughs> After one of our many lengthy digressions. <laughs> In the actual story, uh, the origin of the hind is within the known lands of ancient Greece. Uh, according to Callimachus's hymn to Artemis. Artemis came upon a herd of five golden-horned hinds on a hill in Parhasia, in Arcadia, in the central Peloponnese. 
However, the very next line then states that they heard it by the banks of the Anauros River, which is in Thessaly on the east coast. It's about halfway between Athens and Thessaloniki. So that's quite a bit of a distance. Mm. Four of these she harnessed in order to draw her golden chariot, and the fifth one she let free on the hill of Kerinea, which is in Archaea, also on the north coast of the Peloponnese. And the poem stated that it might be in the after days a labour for Heracles. And so it's here on the hill of Kerinea that Apollodorus states that Heracles found it. Heracles then hunts it for a whole year, as he's quite wary of directly attacking it so as not to kill it and anger Artemis. Mm. Eventually, Heracles shoots and wounds the deer in its leg as it crosses the river Ladon, which is at Mount Artemisian, which is a sacred mountain to Artemis, and the name later became a general name for her shrines. And he then carries the wounded deer to Eurystheus on his back. Artemis and Apollo confront him about this as he returns, but he pleaded that the hind had not been seriously harmed and that he was acting on the orders of Eurystheus, and so Artemis and Apollo allow him to complete the labour. Diodorus Siculus doesn't specify an origin of the deer or any claim on it by Artemis, only that it's a golden-horned hind known for its swiftness of foot. He also claims that Heracles captured it with intelligence and not with violence, saying that in the performance of this labour, his sagacity stood him in not less stead than his strength of body. For some say he captured it by the use of nets, others that he tracked it and mastered it while it was asleep, and some that he wore it out by running it down. So no mention of wounding it at all. In the description in the book that I mentioned earlier, the unauthorised biography of Heracles, it claims that Eurystheus demanded the hind his menagerie, while Heracles promised to Artemis that he would return it to her. So Heracles demanded that Eurystheus come out himself to accept the hind, as the labour specified to deliver it to him. Heracles then set the hind down before Eurystheus, which com- counted the labour as complete, and then the hind immediately fled before Eurystheus could catch it, and so could not argue that he could disqualify Heracles from succeeding at that one. However, like I say, that one is from the unauthorised biography, and so there is no, I don't have a direct source for that one, so take that as a modern interpretation or just as something that I can't yet back up. <laughs> Fair enough. I believe then, Crofty, after the end of that particular tale, we have almost a little bit of an interlude in his story. Yes, we have a slight digression on the way to Heracles's fourth labour, uh, in which Heracles goes from being a hero and the son of gods to being an extinction-level event, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah th- this is one of the uh this is one of the parts of the story where in a modern view it would disqualify him from being a hero mm. but here it's just accepted as something that he did yeah so when traveling for his fourth labor heracles stayed the night in the home of the centaur pholus in ancient greece centaurs were as They're quite commonly depicted in fantasy. An entire horse body with four legs, with a human body from the waist upwards sprouting where the horse's neck would be. However, these centaurs are also quite brutish. Uh, They eat their meat raw. They're very large and strong enough to uproot trees with their bare hands. Pholus is slightly different from most centaurs in that he walks on two legs, so he only has the hind legs of a horse. And he was also the wisest of centaurs, or one of the two wisest centaurs. So his personality much more fits the more modern depictions of centaurs as wise and nature-loving. In the house of Pholus, two of them shared a meal, with Pholus eating his meat raw and Heracles eating his cooked. Heracles, during this meal, called for wine. Apollodorus says that the wine belonged to all of the centaurs, and so Pholus was reluctant to open it, and Heracles insisted. Diodorus Siculus says that the wine had been given to Pholus by Dionysus four generations previously, and Dionysus had told him 
only to open it for a man named Heracles. Either way, the wine was strong enough that when it was opened, all of the centaurs smelled it. Whether it was opening their wine and so they reacted in anger, or opening super strong Dionysus wine, which drove them mad, they attacked Pholus's house. Uh, hmm. Some of them, like I say, could uproot trees, and so they were using entire trees as clubs. Some were armed with firebrands, some were armed with axes. And Heracles single handedly killed at least a dozen of them, and the remaining ones fled. Heracles, not being happy about centaurs trying to kill him, decided to chase them all down. Nephile, the cloud goddess, who was the mother of centaurs, attempted to slow Heracles in his pursuit with endless rain, but Heracles was undeterred. He tracked them halfway across Greece, from Arcadia in the north of the Peloponnese, all the way to Malaya in the very far south, so several weeks travel on foot in the pouring rain. The remaining centaurs had begged the protection of Chiron, who was an immortal centaur who had been directly born from the gods, and I believe some accounts had him teaching Heracles in his youth, but I can't remember. Um, I didn't encounter that myself. I know that he was considered a friend to Heracles in some way, so that would be why they tried to shelter with him, thinking that he could talk Heracles down, I think was the interpretation. Um, but I could be wrong on that. Okay. Regardless of any previous relationship um, between Heracles and Chiron, Heracles was still insistent on trying to slaughter all of the centaurs in response to them attacking him, and he shot at them with his poisoned arrows. And one of the shafts unfortunately hit Chiron. And since the poison of the Hydra could kill anything, Chiron was basically stuck hovering in pain between life and death. Yeah, unable to actually die. Yeah, so I would basically interpret it as dying over and over again, I think, is the best way of... I kind of saw it as like, this is interpretive, I must admit, but I kind of saw it as like uh, someone who is just living in constant burning pain from the venom of the Hydra uh, that's dri driven him to the point of wishing for death. Yeah, I think that might be the best way, actually, of interpreting it. Mm. Again, it's all interpretive at this point. Yeah, the, the sources basically just state that he couldn't die, yeah. but he was hovering between the two. So Apollodorus says here that Prometheus, who was chained to a mountain in punishment for stealing fire from the gods and daily having his liver eaten by an eagle. Yeah, that, that Prometheus. That Prometheus. <laughs> um, offered to take Chiron's immortality and his pain from him. And so Chiron died and Prometheus added to his suffering. Mm. However, that's going to become important later. Indeed it is. This is uh, something, that will be in, something that will be covered in part two. Yes. And so, Deodorus Siculus claims of the centaurs that escaped that Heracles tracked them all down, and they each received fitting punishment, meaning that he killed them all. Yeah, he, he Heracles them. Yes, yes, he turned them all into a fine red mist. Hmm. Which, uh, considering a madness was upon them, and after the first dozen or so, they knew to, you know, flee and leave them alone. Yeah. Might have been overdoing it a little bit. Possibly, but uh, Heracles is the personification of overdoing it a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's the whole point, yeah. That is a very appropriate description hmm. of him. One final note on the centaur story and on the sorrow bringing arrows Pholus had been following Heracles and finding the destruction left in his wake he drew an arrow from the body of one of the dead centaurs and while wondering how so small a thing could cause such destruction he accidentally dropped the arrow on his own foot and died of the poison and was found and buried by Heracles mm. So these arrows were very sorrow-bringing, as they were described earlier. And with that, I believe that's where I should be handing over to you. Indeed. There is one hanging thread that I think is important for us to establish from Centaur's story. Uh, in Apollonius's version, um, one of the few to of centaurs to escape from Heracles' wrath was a centaur by the name 
of Nessos, who fled to the river Evanos. Just uh, pack him away in the back of your mind, because uh, he's coming back eventually. And uh, Heracles may have wanted to get, yeah, he may have wanted to deal with him, because it's going to have complications down the line. The one time he wasn't thorough about making sure everyone was dead. Mm. The, un- the one time he underdid it. <laughs> But yes, I believe that is the hand over to me. And um, the thing about that story, Crofty, is um, that story in some versions um, of the telling basically is the actual body of the fourth labour of Heracles in many ways. Because the um, description of the actual labour itself, in most cases that I could find, is actually significantly less than those uh, given of his encounter with the centaur. I am talking of Heracles's goal to capture the Erymanthian boar. So this labour very much follows on from the style of the previous labour, the hind. In fact, you could probably say that both of these particular labours are really examples of Heracles having to show restraint compared with his previous tasks. Um, I would almost say that this is the closest you get to a thematic progression in the labours, in that the goal of his previous labour was to retrieve an animal known for being difficult to catch. This time he has to retrieve an animal that is also dangerous to him and not kill it as well. Yeah, so showing even more restraint than he had to show with the deer. Mm. So Eurystheus tasks Heracles with retrieving the Erymanthian boar, which is given as dwelling on the mountain of Lampeia in Arcadia. Um, the actual description provided by Apollodorus here of the labour itself is very, very brief. I think this is, if possibly this and maybe um, the sixth labour are his briefest possible explanations. Um, and indeed his section on the centaurs is much longer. In his version, Heracles' contention with the beast is described simply as thus. He chased the beast from the thicket with loud cries, and thrusting it exhausted into deep snow, he trapped it in a noose, and took it to Mycenae. That's it. He doesn't provide a wider description of the beast or anything like that. Simply that it is a creature that Heracles retrieved. Hmm. A nice easy one. But uh, luckily for us, I have a couple more fragments of information regarding it. So, Diodorus Culus, as we mentioned beforehand, similarly provides a short description, but he gives a little bit more. Mostly he emphasises the difficulty of the task. Uh, So to quote him, it required of the man who fought such a beast that he possessed such a superiority over it as to catch precisely the proper moment in the very heat of the encounter. For should he let loose, while it still retained its strength, he would be in danger from its tushers, which is a word meaning tusks, effectively. I think it means like um, a diminished canine in the exact definition when I looked it up. Mm. Uh, and should he attack it more violently than was proper, then he would have killed it, and so the labour would remain unfulfilled. So as we say again, yeah. Uh, increased restraint on Heracles' behalf. Ultimately, however, as in Apollodorus's version, he is indeed able to subdue the beast, and he carries it back to Mycenae. In Diodorus's version, however, Eurystheus is so terrified by the creature that he hides himself in the bronze vessel. We should note that the previous version of the bronze vessel we described was in Apollodorus's account. So it's not really a payoff, but it's as close as a payoff as we're going to get on the bronze vessel here. But it's another sign of Eurystheus's kind of inferiority over Heracles and in the unjust nature of Heracles having to serve under such a man. I have an additional minor fragment on this topic that comes to us from an early historian by the name of Hecateus of Miletus who I discussed briefly in my Druze video again. He gives us a tiny little extra fragment, which says, where the previous two simply say that there is a boar to be retrieved by Heracles, he writes that there was a boar on the mountain and it was doing much harm to the people of Sophis. And uh, Sophis, for reference, as Crowdy gave a few geographical examples beforehand, Sophis was an ancient Greek city on the northwestern end of Arcadia. So again, these all these labors are taking place in a relatively self-contained area of mainland Greece. So that is really the extent of the fourth labor. It is quite short, and I could not find many more elaborate sources on it. 
that unfortunately is going to be the trend with the next two labors that I'm going to be covering. And I think it's a nice kind of gentle way for us to wrap up this episode when we'll come to the end of them. Uh, the flip side to this, by having labors four through six for me to explain, is I get labors 10 through 12, which will more than make up for in detail. <laughs> so, labor five is often referred to as the stable of Orgeus, or in the version of uh, Apollodorus's works that I found, the Castle of Angelus is the other version. I don't know where that, that name comes from. It just was the title in the translation I had, which was the Oxford translation. For this labour, Heracles was tasked with removing all the dung of the cattle of Orgeus without assistance in a single day. So the goal in this particular case by Eurystheus is not to give uh, Heracles a difficult task like he did for some of his earlier labours, or even something which he had to use guile and restraint in order to accomplish. His goal here was almost purely just to humiliate Heracles by making him shovel dung. And that comes across in Diodorus's very brief description. If you kind of read through the subtext and later statements Diodorus makes, it's also implied that such a dishonourable act may have actually been designed to make Heracles unworthy of immortality. So another example of Eurystheus uh, trying to do Heracles in in one way or another. Now there are a number of complications around these cattle. So, so not only was it described that the dung of these cattle in the stable had been left for many years without being cleared, but in another version I've also seen these cattle are so healthy and so lusty that they produce a vast amount of dung as well. So the general conceit of this whole labour is it's impossible for Heracles to actually do this in one day. So the version given by Diodorus, for once, is actually shorter than the version given by Apollodorus. And it simply says, Surely, then, we may marvel at the ingenuity of Heracles, for he accomplished the ignoble task involved in the command without incurring any disgrace or submitting to something that would render him unworthy of immortality. And he did so by diverting the course of the near Alpheus River to cleanse the stables, and thus accomplished the task in one day. This version, it's very simple. Heracles goes to the place and diverts the river. The version given by Apollodorus is more elaborate. In this version, Augeus was a son of Poseid either Poseidon or Apollo, and was king of Elis, in the western reaches of the Panopolis. This king was known for having many herds of cattle, and in this case, Heracles approached him and he chose not to actually reveal Eurystheus's order. Instead, he simply offered to remove the dung that had accumulated in a single day in return for receiving one-tenth of the cattle as his payment. In this case, Heracles again diverted the Alpheus River, but in this occasion, he also diverted another river called the Peneos to clean the dung. And according to Emma Stafford's version, I think there are another version where he diverts yet another river as well. So it is a little variable as to the exact geography of how this is going on. So with the deed completed, Augeus refuses to pay him after he has discovered that the task was done at the order of the king of Mycenae and Tyrans. But then Augeus goes a little further and he claims that he never made the promise in the first place. Luckily, Heracles had fought to bring a witness to his deeds and the agreement, uh, which was Augeus' son, Phileas. Augeus agrees to go before judges on this particular case, and Phileas stands as a witness against his father. Upon him doing this, Augeus flies into a rage and banishes both of them from his kingdom. The result of all this is that not only does Heracles leave empty-handed, and as a result of his haggling for the tenth of the cattle, Eurystheus, much as he did with the second labour against the Hydra, ultimately says this is not a valid labour, due to Heracles having effectively worked for pay, and, by all accounts, using the rivers to clean the stables, rather than doing it himself. This last bit is very much a Wikipedia thing I found whilst I was going through that claims there is another version, apparently, where Heracles... Upon Augeus flying into rage, Heracles simply kills Augeus and gives his kingdom to Phileus. Um, I could not find a primary source for that version. 
does sound like something Heracles would do, though. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem with being so famous for doing things a certain way, is people attribute <laughs> all sorts of things to you. But yes, so uh, again, difference between Apollodorus uh, and Diodorus, it's a part of the 12 labours that Heracles was always fated to complete. In Apollodorus, this now moves the number of tasks that he must complete to 12 rather than the 11 he had before. So the final labour, which I'm going to be covering today, and the last part of the first episode, is going to be on the Symphalian birds. This is a bit of a damp squib of a labour to end on, I must admit, Crofty. It's a bit mundane compared to those which came before it. I found two different versions of it. In this version, Eurystheus tasks Heracles with driving off the Stymphalian birds, who, according to Diodorus, had been destroying the country around the lake of Stymphalus, which the version, when I looked this up, um, it's actually a town or a swamp that is situated in the northeast of ancient Arcadia as well. So again, we're still in quite a local area when you think about uh, where Heracles will end up going in his later labours. Due to the vast number of the birds which had sheltered there, which I believe, according to Apollodorus, they had sheltered there due to fear of being eaten by the wolves in the surrounding area, there was no real way for Heracles to overcome them by sheer force of will or physical prowess as he had in some of his previous tasks, or mo all of his previous tasks, really. So, in this case, Heracles had to use his pure in ingenuity. Here's where there's a little bit of a split in the account. So one of the accounts, which is a bit funnier, I must admit, uh, up until a certain point anyway, is that according to Apollodorus, Heracles couldn't think of anything he could do to drive the birds away. So at this point, his half-sister Athena again steps in and gives him a set of bronze castanets that she had been given by the divine smith Hephaestus. It's very simple from this point onwards. He simply drives the birds up into the air with their noise, and Heracles simply shoots them down with his arrows. So Heracles doesn't really display much guile in that version, because he basically has someone else do it for him, and then he shoots stuff. Is again fitting with some versions of the earlier labours as well. Mm. Uh, the slightly smarter version on Heracles' behalf is Diodorus's version, in which he fashions a bronze rattle by which he was able to create such a din that he drove the birds away. This is the version that's also uh, included by authors, uh, as we mentioned before, by Pisandros, and also by Apollonios, who we'll probably get into a little bit in the next episode, as he is the author of the Argonautica, which Heracles is in for a minute. So, Crofty, we've come to the end of the first part. We're now halfway through the labours, and uh, what have we got in store next time? Next time, we see Heracles start to go further afield mm. from Greece, travelling as far as the lands of the Amazons. Would you, uh, would you or would you not call this part the legendary journeys? Could call this part the legendary journeys, yes. Mm, yes, uh, I'll just bleep that bit out so we don't get sued by the people <laughs> who actually made that TV show. Mm. If we got sued, I'd be very disappointed. So this is, to me, is Hercules getting through the first half of the task, and now he's going on to bigger and better things. Mm. Heracles on tour. Indeed. So, folks, we'll be uh, back as soon as we can, as soon as we write the second part <laughs> of this episode. Is it, is it obvious <laughs> that we uh, deliberately split this up so that we had to do half as much work the first time? No, that's, that's not really what happened, but uh, we're going to claim it was. So, same time next year? Same time next year, indeed. <laughs> so, before we go today, I would just like to quickly mention a few things to do with the channel. So, if you want to support the channel a little bit further, you can follow me over on Twitter at twitter.com slash the underscore histocrat, where I generally keep people updated as to what the topics of future podcasts are going to be, and when about we're hoping to get one out. Basically, whenever we have time to get together these days. In addition to this, if you'd also like to help support the channel a little bit further, you can head on over to patreon.com slash thehistocrat, where I am taking any proceeds and using it and funding it straight back into the channel to improve things like channel art, equipment, and anything else that I feel could help the process. So, quick thank you to everyone on there who has pledged so far. And that's everything I had to plug. So, uh, 
It's good night from me, Crofty. And it's good night from him. Good night. <laughs>